Okay. Meeting is being convened at 6.56. Trustees Abercrombie, Mooring, Sikowski, and Latham are in person. Rose is via Zoom and geez, and Joanne is absent. Kaneski. Whatever. Joanne is absent. Um, okay, we will begin with the minutes from June 11th, which were distributed. Did anybody have any? From July. The minutes from July 13. Uh-oh. So I sent you the wrong ones. No, you sent the right one. Oh, but it's. Oh, I'm okay. I'm sorry. I see what I, I'm looking at. Minutes of June 11th were approved. Yes. Yes. So the correction that I would make on the minutes, which was my the error, the is the date was not <laughs> up at the top. It is now in Drive. I did correct it. Oh, okay. Um, but if you didn't print it or look at it as of an hour ago, it would not have said that. Okay. With the date added at the top, are there any other corrections or suggestions or changes proposed? In that okay. case, I would be happy to entertain a motion to approve. Oh. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. He's working on it. Yep, he's there just now with. John, anytime you are ready to join us, we will be happy to have you. There you are. Hey, Captain Yanni, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? Doing well. I have found that. On Zoom, if my audio cuts out and I plug in my headphones, so if that happens, just let me know. You're a little bit broken up. It, it's your staccato. 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 Is that what that, oh, that's a good word for it. Why don't we have uh, when he's ready? Why don't we have John introduce himself for the for the record and for the minutes? Just see. So yes. Just give me a moment, I'm plugging my headphones. This is the equivalent in the old day of tapping on the microphone. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, um, now, is that any better? We'll yes, see. a little better, I think. If it, if it ends up not being better, if I get choppy again, just please let me know. Okay. This is never perfect. We'll, we'll never is. Yeah. So, John, can you just introduce yourself to the group um, so that everyone knows who you are and why you are here? Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me. So, my name is John Kopeski. I'm the project manager from Gale Associates uh, for this project, um, where we were retained to do visual evaluation of your group at the Audi Library. So I oversaw the our site personnel that did the observations, and I also reviewed and edited and finalized the report that you had an opportunity to review, hopefully. Yes. Great. So I don't know how we want to do this. We, we spoke on the phone earlier today and just kind of you know went over some things. And I know I said I don't I didn't want us to have to go through the report line by line, but in reading through it, I made my own notes. And I think at the end of the day, if it makes sense to the rest of the trustees, that it, it would make sense to maybe go through here and you know the things that stood out to various members of the board, 
maybe we could just discuss them and then um, and then from that maybe we go to your summary of the of the findings does that make sense to do it that way or should we do it in, in reverse have the summary first and then go through some of the things that stand out in the report how would you prefer it I think doing the details first makes doing sense. the details okay and everyone's read it and everyone's up to date so um, okay well do, just jump in I'm just gonna start from from page one I my first questions came on page two and if I'm going too fast please tell me someone to slow down but um, I had the, the question on the uh, the section on document review where you have closeout submittal Gosh. and you noted um, that we should look at the images, you know, the, schema the schematics, the cross sections of uh, roofing sections. Could you explain the relevance of those images? Because none of us here are, are engineers or architects, so can you explain the relevance of, of why you asked us to look at these specifically? That was on page yeah, absolutely. Page two. So I'm flipping. I'm flipping on page two now. Uh, And if it would be beneficial at any point for me to share my screen, which would put the, yeah. the it's kind of fall apart when I'm, do you want me to go ahead and do that now? Yeah, I think that would That'd be good. Be great. Sure, absolutely. And before I, I, I go forward, it's helpful to know, um, I guess just a, it doesn't have to be informal, just the folks I'm uh, speaking with here, just a quick introduction on oh, your behalf. I'm sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, just go around the table and everyone introduce yourselves. I am Lynn. I am chair of the library trustees. I was also on the building committee. Great, nice to meet you, Lynn. I am Jack. I was also on the building committee at the time. My background is in engineering, but I'm not a PE. Okay, great. Nice to meet you, Jack. I'm Susan. Uh, I was not on the building committee. Uh, this is my second year as a trustee. I'm Wayne. No. I'm new to the committee okay. this year. Great. Julie, hi, Bob. Oh, hi. I'm I'm Ju Patrick, and then I'm Julie, and I'm also this is my first year on the on the board. Wonderful, nice to meet you. Sorry, Julie. I forgot you were up there. <laughs> Here I am, yeah. <laughs> looking in. Great, and I think that's everyone. Yes, that's everyone. Great. So we, well, we only have trustees here. No, no one from, unfortunately, no one from the town administration was able to join us, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it is. If it ever comes down to the need to have another conversation that they'd be able to attend and you would like us to attend, we're happy to do so. Just let us know. Great. Thank well, you. this is being recorded, so even if they don't ask the question, perhaps we will ask what they want to know or hear so they will be have will be, will be able to have access to that okay great okay. um so going back uh patrick uh to your question on page two you're talking about this close up middle here right yeah and i'm just skipping this up real quick to understand where your question lies. Uh, did you have a line in particular? Well, it, so I yeah, to talk it, about it. at the bottom of the paragraph, you had, you had stated ventilation provisions are not shown in the as-built drawings. Note the below images. So um, it, can you just explain how these illustrate that the lack of, of ventilation or where would it normally be and w what would you expect to, to see? But what are these indicating? Absolutely. So. <clears throat> Take a quick step back. Um, in general, it's 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 pretty it's roofing industry standard practice that when you have a steep slope roof and you're using asphalt shingles in our climate, right, the northeast region, um, many manufacturers and industries guidelines, the roofing industry standards, NRCA, so on and so forth, recommend having a dedicated ventilation path that travels underneath the underside of the shingles. So in a, in a roof like yours, uh, you have a, a roof deck and you try to follow on your, my highlights and if I'm going too fast or if you don't understand what I'm saying, just slow me down. Um, this is the roof deck here uh, that is highlighted in green. We changed my thickness. 
Okay. <clears throat> so above the roof deck, you have your roof assembly, which in this case, it calls for vapor barrier, which is this a solid dash line, rigid insulation, another layer of uh, like a roof deck, whether it be a plywood or an OSP, and then your asphalt shingles directly on top of that over an underlay. So when you have ventilation, oftentimes you are trying to pull air from your eave condition, which is this detail here. The eave is like the down slope portion of your roof. There's usually a dedicated path to bring air in up and underneath your asphalt shingles in this fashion. This detail here does not include any path for air to travel underneath your asphalt shingles. So John, are you saying that that would be a ridge vent that you would expect on top of the roof? I'm thinking more from a residential house perspective. Yeah, so with, with ventilation, you have what we call an intake vent, which is going to be usually located at the eave, right, which is this detail down here. And then you have the exhaust venting, which happens at the top center or your ridge, right? Yeah. So if you think of your house, oftentimes you see that the top of your roof, if you have an asphalt shingle roof, mm -hmm. has the ridge vent with a cap shingle over it. You can kind of see a shadow line if you look up oftentimes. That's your exhaust. That, that is supposed to take the air that you're supposed to be coming from the intake and exhausting it out the top of it. So uh, I believe if I skip to the ridge detail here, there is no exhaust ventilation shown in this detail as well. Would that make this a hot roof or a cold roof? We've heard those terms thrown out as part of this project. I, I personally have not used hot roof, cold roof terms before. I've seen that term used in the literature that we reviewed for this project, and it is a, a term that some folks use. It would be, I guess, considered a hot roof in that you're not providing a, a ventilation path. You're not providing any ventilation for the asphalt shingles in this case. Okay. Some people deem that as a hot roof. I personally have never used that term, and I would just say this is an unvented uh, asphalt shingle roof design. So in the case... may consider those terms synonymous. In, in the case, if you're familiar with the way the lower roof meets the upper roof, where would the vent be for the lower roof as it meets the, you know, the, the lower, the clerestory wall? Where would that typically so be? So that's this, that's, de that's this detail here. <laughs> Uh, there are proof, there are options that some shingle manufacturers have, or some manufacturers that specialize in providing ventilation for roofs. Right, it might not be from the shingle manufacturer, uh, but their air vent is one example of a manufacturer that just develops ventilation systems for roofs. Right, um, so I would expect that as we're coming from the the downslope portion of the roof or the eaves, right, this green line here, the air would, in a vented system, travel this way start traveling upslope. In this case, where you have a clear story wall, right? That, that green arrow continues up. There are systems uh, or ventilation products on the market that would allow the air to escape right here. Okay. And I could, I could pull up some examples here if we would like to show you or some example of, uh, uh, of these manufacturer details that we have is shown more clearly, but this green out is just to represent that there are uh, systems available that allow that air to escape in this fashion when you have a clear story wall. Yeah. So could you clarify, I'm keeping the minutes today, does this roof have those systems? It does not. It does not have any ventilation systems from what we observed in our field observations, nor from what we observed in the uh, literature that was provided to us to review. And I believe the documents that we were provided, we have stated in this document review section, uh, it contains a close out submittal package, which we kind of highlight in this paragraph of what that consisted of. Um, uh, I believe it, it contained asphalt drums, right? That's where I'm pulling these snippets from, the asphalt drums, dated October 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and, and any of the literature within that close-up middle package that we received from Patrick, we did not see any 
uh, ventilation provisions. So, what is the result of not there not being any ventilation? What is the effect? So the benefit of having ventilation is well. Let me let me start over there. Um, many asphalt shingle manufacturers require ventilation in our region, in the Northeast region, to be able to uh, obtain a warranty from them. Uh, they call for the requirement to have ventilation uh, if they're going to warrant the city. Having ventilation um, in, in, the, in the industry, uh, in the roofing industry, there's kept it can always change, right? There, there's new findings in the roofing industry and many industries, but as of right now, they're saying that having ventilation can help to cool the other side of the actual shingles. It can also help to move any latent moisture that might exist within your roof assembly below the asphalt shingles. Um, if there's any latent moisture in here or humidity, it will help move that air out as well. So the ventilation provides a path for air and humidity to pass through and help cool and keep the underside of the asphalt shingles dry. Without providing ventilation, there are uh, uh, many studies that talk about how that can result in the uh, reduced surface life of your asphalt shingles, whether that be from cupping or a term they often uh, use is called shingle bake, where the asphalt shingles get too hot and they can start cupping and curling individually. That's more of a widespread condition. But also we've, we've seen instances where it can uh, lead to the asphalt shingle buckling uh, that you're seeing in the building. So the, it can the, be a contributor to that condition. The, does the grade of the shingle, the quality of the shingle, it's, I don't know how shingles are rated in terms of you know how strong or how much of a beating they're supposed to be able to take from heat or other other conditions but are there shingles where i mean it's it's product by product in, in our case it seems from what i am understanding um our product required that ventilation there are there other products that would not have required that ventilation where this could have just simply been the wrong product for this roof had they chosen a different product or is it simply that Sh asphalt shingles must have ventilation in this sort of application. So typically asphalt shingle manufacturers, from what we've seen and all the, uh, the manufacturers, the products we review and specify, call for either the need or requirement to have ventilation for asphalt shingles that they uh, manufacture or strongly encourage it. And there may be some language written within the warranty if you read the fine print uh, of those manufacturers, don't don't, don't blank them, throw a regular face that it's required. There still might be some language in the warranty. Um, if you don't provide ventilation, that could impact your warranty. So generally speaking, asphalt shingles, uh, for what we've seen and worked with, require ventilation or strongly encourage it. Yes, there are other roof systems beyond asphalt shingles where you don't need ventilation. Uh, I can go through the examples. I know this report talks about some examples to get there, but um, it, did that answer your question, uh, Patrick? I think it did, yes. Do, you, do I understand that you're, you're saying our roof does not have ventilation yes. or the plan right. does not show ventilation? Both. Both. So Both. it's certified that our roof does not have ventilation. Okay. Correct. So moving along, did anyone have any uh, questions about the interior observations in the report? Yeah, pretty much. And really quick, before, before we do that, there's, there's yeah. you know, some really, really quick, easy graphics that help describe some of this stuff. Um, I didn't have you know, our, our in-house uh, presentation handy at this time, but this is just a nice quick graphic that shows one example of one way you might achieve intake ventilation at your eave condition, again, the eave condition is the down slope portion here, is you provide vent, uh, slots in your soffit so that air can pull through the slots in your soffit. This is one example of how you might do it, and that's what this is showing. So this soffit right here has perforations in it to allow air to travel up, continue up slope, and out your 
bridge that, that's up in this particular example. So I'm hoping that point is best illustrated with this quick image I, I Googled. So John, it looks like some sort of chimney effect in essence uh, with that particular drawing that you have on the screen right now where the air is pulled up and then out at the ridge vent. That yeah, it, it, you can, you, yep, that's, a, that's an okay way of looking at it. It's the circulation of air, how the airflow will travel. Um, so that applies to a residential construction, but I guess I'm wondering about the difference to a commercial building such as this. Why would it be different? So, <clears throat> one main difference we, we see between like, your house with residential houses uh, when it comes to roofing is you may not know, you might have uh, adequate ventilation without even knowing that the roof is installed. If you look around your house, you might see that you, in your eave condition, you have a soffit, and that soffit has slots in it, so mm -hmm. that airflow can travel in. That's not, if you see that, that doesn't necessarily mean you're good to go, right? There, there has to be a dedicated path, or in some cases, you bring the air into your attic. If, you're, if your insulation is not at your level, which I know my house is, uh, I just have some insulation at the floor level. Mm -hmm. um, that, that effectively means that the attic is uninsulated. For uninsulated attics, typically on houses, it looks like this, where you're pulling the air in, it's allowed to enter your attic space, which is oftentimes why your attic is really cold or really hot in the, in, in the cold or hot months, respectively. Um, but the idea is it allows water, uh, air to enter your attic so it can travel up your deck between your roof rafters and ultimately make its way out of the top. That's providing circulation of air that's helping to still cool the asphalt shingles. Uh, for commercial buildings, you still might have a construction like this. It really depends on where your dedicated thermal barrier is, thermal barrier being insulation. Yeah. On your roof, your insulation, and on many, many commercial roofs that have either a vaulted ceiling or an attic space, uh, many times um, the designers put the insulation outside of this deck right here. And that's what you have in your building, which is not as common on, on houses. So that's just one example of a common difference between residential houses and commercial construction for this type of roof. Not to say you can't do one way or another, you can do insulation above your deck on, on your house. It's just not usually common practice. Um, but you do have this condition now, right? You have a roof deck, a bunch of insulation on top of your roof deck. Then you have another layer of plywood or OSB uh, sheathing, underlayment, then shingles. There's, so there's a lot more at play there yeah. and a lot more potential for installation defects or field tolerances in the installation just more attention to detail for the roofer, roofing contractor that has to follow. Mm -hmm. Not just looking at the asphalt shingle instructions, but looking at all the insulation. It's just industry standard practices to get all the materials in place. So there's just more steps in the case of commercial construction, uh, uh, typically than the construction of the house. Thanks for explaining that distinction. And the goal of any house or building is you want a continuous thermal there. Oftentimes the walls, you can see with pink here, you have insulation in your walls, whether that's between the studs of your wall or still outboard of your wall. But you always want to try to marry or connect the wall thermal barrier with your roof thermal barrier. These are all things we could confirm. Now we can, we can, we can uh, assess and look at what the design shows with respect of trying to achieve a continuous thermal barrier. But we can't confirm what was installed because we haven't done any exploratory test cuts. All we can see right now is what we saw visually from being on the roof, using our drones, looking around visually. Yes, we can see there's no ventilation provisions. That's obvious because we don't see any dedicated intake. There's no dedicated exhaust. There's no mechanical vents, right? You might see in your roof on your house, you might have a a weird little box in your roof. That would either be serve as an intake or an exhaust, depending on where it's located. Or if you have a, a, a house with a, a dorm, a dorm is not uh, for a break condition. Uh, it would be like looking at this house, 
but not a cross-section merge, you might see a little uh, louver window there. That also could be added to your uh, roof ventilation uh, provisions on top. So there's multiple different ways of providing ventilation. From what we saw visually on your roof, there are none. The design doesn't call for any ventilation. Therefore, our conclusion is the designer designed this roof to not have ventilation, and the contractor installed it as such. So to that point, would uh, would the configuration that is found on this building, had we installed the originally intended metal roof on this, would this be an unusual design for a metal roof, or would it be typical for a metal for a metal roof? There are some metal panel materials that require ventilation, mm -hmm. but when you're talking painted aluminum, which is a pretty common. Uh, type of uh, static sea metal panel or painted galvanized steel, those typically do not require ventilation. So that could have been installed on this roof as designed without ventilation provisions. If you're talking about certain other, like uh, certain uh, tin zinc copper panels, those do require ventilation, but more often than not, you're talking about aluminum and galvanized steel that's painted, those do not require ventilation. Are those, do those not require ventilation because they are softer metals? Uh, they don't require ventilation. Uh, well, asphalt shingles require ventilation because I said that it's the way that, yeah. So, so asphalt shingles require ventilation uh, to help keep the other side cool. Cooler. And right. just the way they're, they're the, the way they're constructed, uh, if not allowed to, or if, if it's, Staying at one temperature on the top side, differential temperature on the other side, it's su it's subject to that 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 thermal difference or moisture difference on the top side. It can it can make that material warm. Metal panels doesn't have that um, typically as a, as a downside on that ventilation. Uh, it's just it's just the way uh, you know aluminum and steel sheet metal uh, works. You don't because they're more stable. They're they're not as subject to they're, 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 it's very thin metal we're talking about it's very thin metal so the temperature differentiation uh differential from the top side versus the underside so it's small that effect doesn't cause it to warp as it does with asphalt shingles okay and the way you. that bituminous material is that it um, Metal roofs do have a bunch of other design considerations that um, you have to incorporate and have to be successful. I know, Patrick, I was talking to you about the effects of oil canning, right? The oil canning effect of, of metal panels is when you have a very thin gauge sheet metal and you create a wide panel that, if you look at it from far away, from under the right sunlight, there's just some, it, it could look like a wavy surface or a deformed surface. Just because it's such a thin metal, it's a wide, um, a, a wide panel, and that and that condition alone can cause it to be undesirable for many folks. But there's ways to design uh, your metal panel system to help reduce the potential of oil canning. Again, I'm just saying that because it's important. Uh, if, if this roof, if this roof was designed to be a metal panel roof. We would be looking at the design to see what they incorporated to see uh, to limit that effect. So it's not just a solid ball for a building up there all set. There's a lot of design and consideration that needs to go into it on behalf of the design to meet the needs and the goals of the client. What are the what are the implications of your findings for what should be done to this roof? Is there imminent damage that we're likely occurring? What should be done? So as far as I remember, Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's written in this report. Let me flip back very quickly, actually. Uh, oftentimes, we always start our reports with the uh, interior leak audit or uh, interview information that we've obtained from folks from the development. So I think right now, we understand that there are some active leaks on this roof. Is that right, Patrick? We have observed leaks in several locations that led to the stains photographed there. Uh, they have been, as far as we know, repaired. We haven't had a new leak since, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the most recent was. one was sometime in the winter, I believe, perhaps the spring. 
Uh, but as, since then, we haven't observed anything new. Those, well, sorry, you, you just sit past the Clara Story windows um, and the caulking on those, that has been repaired. Um, and the roof has had someone up there to do some patching and, and tighten up what, what they could observe to be faulty or a potential cause of a leak. Okay. And so we've also had very heavy rains and examples of high wind and rain that have not yet shown any new water damage on the ceiling tiles that we're aware of that well that, yeah well, that we have <laughs> you know sometimes you never know it could have been right. six months and you didn't know but nothing that we're aware of right and there could be late miscellaneous defects like it looks like at some point there were some fasteners that popped that may have caused a hole in asphalt shingle path at some point by uh, either JD River that you could have to go out there a couple times or patches and stuff. But if you're talking specifically about the buckling condition, which I believe you, uh, Jack, is that what you were referring to specifically? That was one thing that came up in your report. Um, so the, the buckling condition can reduce the surface life of your asphalt shingle. Let me try to find a good image of the buckle uh, to help explain that. So if you think about this photo here, this, 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 this row of asphalt shingle is buckling upwards, right? I hope that's evident in the photo on the screen that you're looking at. Since it's buckling upwards, it's potentially impacting the seal of the asphalt shingle to the, sh the row of shingles below. So that's one condition. If you're buckling severe enough that you're causing openings in your asphalt shingles and, and breaking that seal, because typically asphalt shingles have uh, an asphaltic seal on the down slope edge of it, so that when the installer installs it, yeah, it's shingle lapped uh, from the one above it. But this bottom edge here, if you look at my fingers, has a, a seal on it. So that you have a nice watertight seal that helps winter refrain from wanting to get up underneath this lap. If your if your shingles buckled, it could help. It could break that seal or cause a tunnel for water to blow up under. Right. So that that effect is one downside of having the asphalt shingles buckling. There is the potential, if the buckling is severe enough, that it allows the tunnel for water to travel up and into your roof assembly. The other thing that can happen is if these buckles, the, you know, I don't know if you notice up there, do they come and go? Sometimes uh, when we see this happen, uh, uh, our clients say that the buckling appears at certain times of the day, but it looks like it rests. So if that's the case and the, and the asphalt shingles are moving pretty regularly, that could be causing some uh, wear and tear on the material and also reduce the surface life of the asphalt shingles. So that would be, I guess, the second example of, of a concern of having this condition on the John, would it, also, would it also impact this, uh, the sheathing underneath and what it's we nailed would, into? I would say um, the buckling itself necessarily wouldn't, but if moisture is getting underneath the asphalt shingles, absolutely. Okay. Once water gets underneath here, there should be a dedicated uh, underlayment which will help keep your, let me go to the cross-section uh, detail of the roof. Or at least go ahead and do this. Uh, so the layer I'm just gonna highlight right now in, um, in red. <coughs> well, let's say this is your, your plywood deck. Uh, or your plywood sheathing that's above your insulation belt. There's, there should be an underlayment layer as well on top of that, which is going to be represented by this blue line here. Bear with me sometimes uh, doing live markup and taking a second to get it calculated. Okay. So this dashed blue line here is uh, an example of an underlayment, which is could either be a synthetic underlayment, like a continuous sheet, or it could be felt paper, it depends on what they use. Um, this this, this underlayment can help. If, if water's blowing in underneath your asphalt shingles, this can help keep the materials below the asphalt shingles dry. But it's not intended to be a waterproof thing. It's intended to help 
the incidental moisture um, from entering the roof assembly or installation below. But if enough water is getting in, we would expect that this uh, dark blue colored arrow, which represents water getting in the system, could continue down into your roof assembly and deteriorate your roof, um, your roof assembly materials, whether it be your, uh, your sheathing here, that's red, your insulation here, and sometimes you can also see rusting on your steel roof deck that you have. I don't know if you, but no, I think we have some photos of some potential rusting, which may either be part of a leak, or it could be part during construction when this roof was originally constructed and left exposed to the elements. Sometimes the steel roof deck can't rust during these moments. But if you're having a, if you're having a drip, uh, should present itself like this, for example, you might see some localized staining or rusting of the steel roof deck where that exists. So, uh, yes, water blowing in can impact your roof assembly materials below your asphalt shingles. Sorry, long-winded answer to the question. I hope I answered it. If not, in, in your experience, do you see this kind of uh, deformations in a roof? This uh, just was just put in three years ago, four years ago? We hope we don't see it, but we have seen it. We, uh, we have a few projects now, actually of recent, that I've worked on um, in a similar capacity where we evaluate the cause of buckling shingles. Some of those roofs do have ventilation, but we're working through those projects separately and analyzing the design and the way it was constructed to see what is going on. Uh, in this case, um, with an unvented roof, um, I, I, I spoke with some folks internally here to get to, to paint their uh, experience as well. And we don't suggest ever doing it on a, on a, a commercial building like this where you have your insulation and everything outboard the deck with asphalt shingles. Purely because the manufacturers of the asphalt shingles don't like it, they often require ventilation. Uh, but also the industry standard uh, Roofing and standards call for ventilation and need uh, So, we have seen some unventilated roofs in residential construction not have this issue. We have seen non ventilated commercial roofs have this issue. So, we've kind of seen the gap. I'm not surprised um, if, if determined that the, uh, the unvented is a, a primary cause of this issue, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case in, in, in this particular project. But you can't uh, say I believe our report talk, talks about other factors that could be contributing to the buckling shingles, because it's not just ventilation, no ventilation, you're good to go when it comes to asphalt shingles. There's a lot that goes into how these other materials are constructed to, to limit that potential uh, condition from occur. Is there a noticeable difference in the buckling on the north facing versus the south facing? Let me check one thing. So we put together this appendix, which is our, again, just visual observations of the exterior. I believe this patch is going to represent uh, widespread buckling of the asphalt shingles. So, uh, where's north of the plan? I believe. Ah. Up is north. Yeah. So, we're seeing it on both, okay. both the north facing roofs and the south facing roofs. Mm -hmm. Pretty consistently where this cross hatch exists. There's the potential that something's going on with this roof that's different than what's going on with this roof. Right, but there are some ice, more isolated conditions of buckling asphalt shingles on this roof on the left hand side here. Still, it's just not presenting itself as being as widespread, more more scattered, and more uh, uh, yeah, I guess more scattered and less less regular. Does anyone have? Uh other questions about the, the the observations from the outside. Um, 
One question I had was um, you had image 25 vegetative growth observed at leading edges of shingle rows. Why is that significant? I would think that you would see that on, um, I mean, you see that on a lot of things in New England where it's wet. If it's on the right, if it's on the north side of a, of a roof or a wall, you'll, you'll have that kind of thing. Is that, why is this, why is this noteworthy in our case? It's an observation we made and it tended to exist at the drip line. It just leads to the idea that this particular um, roof area is probably seeing more prolonged moisture than some other roof areas and maybe less drying. It can also happen in areas where there's less sunshine. So if there's a rising ball here, depending on where the sun is shining, yeah. this particular might have, have that um, algae grow more so than other areas. Oftentimes, if there's nothing wrong with the roof, uh, Manufacturers ask for shingle safe, not a defect or a problem. It's just a condition that occurs. Okay. Uh, some manufacturers talk about their materials, they, they have a, an algae resistant version of their asphalt shingles, so you don't have this condition occur. But it's just something that we observed, uh, so we included it in there um, uh, as an observation. I don't think it's uh, impacting uh, any of the buckling issues that happen there, it's just okay. an observation. Okay. So John, I'm wondering in your observations of the roof, did you see any zinc strips or things like that that people traditionally use to take care of moss and other roof growth? You said zinc strips? Yeah, or any other metals that might be used. I know, I think some people might use copper strips or things like that to limit moss growth. Understood, oftentimes, uh when you have two two pitches converge, the line of the water travels is called valley, right? Yeah. Oftentimes, one uh, detailing option is you could provide a copper or a, a tin sink or some other sheet metal feature on the valley to move that water from the roof and to limit the amount of water that sits on the asphalt shingles and locations. So, if that's what you're talking about. I would have to remind myself by flipping through these images if, yeah, there you go, there's a good example of it. So you do have sheet metal valleys on this roof, which just helps remove water as it travels down this path. Okay. It's not absolutely prior. You could have the oxygen shingles coming together in the weave pattern or some other acceptable pattern and not have the sheet metal and still have to be successful. Um, but they do have uh, these features that are valid. All right, thanks. I so believe you also have some sheet metal features where you have a rising wall, whether it's at the clear story or the cheek wall. I know we talk about that a little bit at the cheek wall on this job. Um, I'll just pull this photo example of that. Here, here's the what we call the cheek wall where you have some step flashing to help keep water from entering your wall or underneath your, your, your roof in this particular location. I believe we observed some concerns with, with the way this was constructed. Uh, I have to remind myself by reading our observations here. Well, you said there weren't any in dams or things like that on some of the flat. Right, right. And uh, you have some over, you know, what we're talking about there is uh, you have some overlapping here, which is good, but uh, best practice uh, may, uh, would have been potentially to extend this metal to this mortar joint here so that instead of having flat metal if this metal uh, extended sorry bear with me if it extended up to this joint here you can effectively upturn the metal within the mortar so that any water that gets here can't roll off the stop and fall down the road. that's the idea of it it would have been best practice to do it but the fact that you do have overlap here, the idea of that is if water is getting on the surface and rolls off, it's gonna hit this one. And hopefully it's gonna travel in this direction from left to right as opposed to this direction from right to left. If it goes from right to left, that could result in leakage then what the configuration of the metal is. So that, that's, that was our point there is, uh, they didn't capture uh, best practice on doing the, the step wash. You mentioned. Again, it's 
We have Brian. The report talks about the difference, the inconsistent um, reveal on the shingles as they're placed. Yes. Do does the variance fall within acceptable standards or do are they outside acceptable standards? I would have to check to see what what industry standard acceptable tolerances are. And this may or may not be a problem. It, it was an observation just to show that potentially um, folks installing the roof didn't didn't pay that much attention to create a monolithic appearance and an equal lapping crack shingles. Uh, typically, depending on the shingle you're using and the manufacturer and of the product, they will have specific installation instructions and requirements for the roof to follow, how much their shingle is supposed to lap, what the minimum is, right? And there's a potential that having this variance is beyond that minimum. We haven't dug into the literature of the approved shingles for this job to see if this is a construction defect that's beyond that that exceeds the manufacturer requirement. We haven't done that level of digging yet. Okay, thank you. Does this does this contribute to asphalt shingle buckling? Uh, I, I don't believe so, uh, but it is an observation. It could be related to something that doesn't meet the manufacturer's requirements. In some cases, it could just be an aesthetic thing. If someone took an issue by looking at the roof from the ground, if you saw enough of this deviation, it might not look nice as well. So Lynn, Patrick, I'm not sure if it's at the point in the conversation where I can ask this, but um, John, if this was your house or if this was your public library, what are your recommendations on next steps? It's a good question. Um, so our report does talk about options, right? Um, with the buckling that you're having, and, and the buckling in the asphalt shingles, um, and some of the other defects that we observed uh, hopefully are, are just isolated conditions that can be repaired. But the buckling itself and, and, the, and the widespread condition of it, um, it can reduce the surface life of your asphalt shingles. Um, we already see potentially that there's a warranty issue on this job where the manufacturer came up, gave some very minor information to you saying, sorry, these conditions are not covered under any warranty. You got them up, right? Um, because the shingles are buckling and it could be reduced service life, I wouldn't be happy with my house. I would want someone to help navigate through what to do with the roof. Uh, I can't tell you how long this roof is going to last compared to a roof that doesn't have this issue. It really depends on a lot of factors of how well the rest of the roof is constructed and maybe the asphalt shingles, or how severe the buckling becomes, or how much variation in movement of the asphalt shingles is occurring over time. Uh, to, to understand how reduced the asphalt shingles uh, service life may be. But uh, I wouldn't be happy if it was my house. Um, John, to go back to the ventilation question, um, is there a way to retrofit ventilation on this roof and would it help at all to, with what's there in terms of extending the life or the buckling? Um, or is this something that is no longer possible at this stage? There's ways to provide vent uh, ventilation. It's gonna it's gonna change the appearance of your building because in order to provide ventilation, you have to provide the intake. Let me see if I have a good uh, image of your building here. This report here's a good image. It's blurry for far, but yeah, yeah. Um, you'd have to basically modify this whole eave condition everywhere you have the eaves. Right. To be able to provide that intake, you can either do it by doing a cut and vent within the uh, within the uh, eave shingles. You can see if there's a way to modify your soffit condition, which I know you have pretty unique detail there where you're coming at two slopes. So that might not be an option. Uh, we'd have to dig into it further to understand how this roof may be modified to provide that intake ventilation. 
uh, to be able to fully answer that. Um, but I would imagine it's going to be severe modifications to the eave condition. You would likely need to, the ridge is, is usually a little more straightforward. You would just probably rip the top of the roof off at uh, the ridge, cut your deck so you can provide a ventilation path. Um, but I would imagine, given that you have insulation without the ventilation space and um, some kind of wood sheathing over top of it, you're probably looking at adding a dedicated airspace on top of what's already in place to be able to provide ventilation. So your overall roof height likely needs to increase in height as well. Wow. So you're not just retrofitting, you're actually pretty much redesigning and redoing completely the roof. We don't know the condition of the materials that are in place below the asphalt stream, but yeah. there is the chance that the insulation materials there are installed properly. Mm -hmm. There's a chance they're not. There's a chance they're wet, there's a chance they're dry. We have to do exploratory to understand the condition of those materials and whether or not we feel like they can remain. Um, but yes, you would have to modify it's assuming they're they're in good shape and that they're installed reasonably well, you would have to modify the whole roof to be able to provide a dedicated path for the air to go. Since your insulation is above your deck, your airflow needs to go above your insulation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this is just a good example of that unique condition you have here to try to get any type of air to follow with concealed in a concealed condition and travel up here is going to be very challenging so there are provisions uh so you know again we can't we can't answer that fully now but you're likely looking at bumping your whole roof system up higher to uh to provide a dedicated intake in this fashion yeah. and then you do uh, a new a new deck on top of that and then your new roof cover on top of that. Is it possible? Yes. It will, it will be expensive. It will uh, change the appearance of the building. Is it going to solve the issue on, uh, if you stay with the asphalt shingle to go on top of this? I can't say at this point whether it, will, uh, whether it likely will, whether it likely will not, because we don't, again, know fully what's happening with all these materials here. Mm -hmm. So do you have a plan uh, B besides that? Because that seems awfully complicated. Yeah. If you're looking, so if you're, if you're doing away with downspout shingles or you want to look at other methods, there are, again, roof systems you can install potentially on this roof, assuming that all these materials are sound. You could remove the asphalt shingles and install a different roof cover. Whether that be a sheet metal, a standard steam sheet metal roof, whether that be a synthetic shingle roof, whether it's synthetic slate, I say synthetic, right? Uh, it would be like a plastic uh, material that doesn't need ventilation underneath. You can install a slate roof on here. Slate does not require ventilation, but now you're talking money, right? Um, <laughs> talking money so you can go with slate. You can go with slate, or you can go with the synthetic version of slate, which is cheaper and also doesn't require, right? That's what that's the point of saying about synthetic. Uh, you can also go with a, a membrane on your steep slope. We have done some designs of PVC membrane roofs where where they offer a replica standing seam appearance. And I could I I could shoot you separately some photos of what that looks like on some, some sample projects uh, after this meeting if interested. Um, but, you know, the low slope membrane roof doesn't require, uh, low slope membrane doesn't require ventilation either. Mm -hmm. Again, these are options, potential options. I can't tell you if they're going to work or not fully yet because I don't know what's happening here, right? What is the general... Uh, yeah, what is the general life expect expectancy of a membrane roof compared to, say, a metal roof, a standing seam metal roof? Is it comparable? Is it shorter? Typically, when we see low slope membrane roofs on flat roofs, which is obvious, you know, which is 99% of the time you're going to install a type of membrane, the life expectancy of those, um, say, one PVC, right? Just one example. 
on the speaker uh, PVC. Uh, we can see that lasting between 25 and 35 years, depending it all you know, depending on the thickness of the memory you use yeah. and the uh, the quality of the installation by the contractor. Okay. So your range is 25 to 35 years with a, a low slope memory roof on the low slope roof. I believe I have to see if if that service life is similar for a slope application. Uh, I would imagine it would be if they're following all the installation requirements of the, of the manufacturer. Yep. Uh, I would have a similar life expectancy. Okay. Uh, if you think of a, a membrane, though, right? That membrane is going to have any underlying unsmoothness project through. I don't know if any of the uh, folks have seen a low slope membrane roof, but oftentimes you see the joints of the cover board project through and it's not a nice clean flat looking appearance and nor, nor should you expect that on your roof if you do build that so there's an aesthetic component I want to bring up in talking about that there's ways to improve the substrate to make it smoother will it ever look completely smooth probably not but there's ways to look at make it look better and um, you know before going down that road that that's a design thing it, yeah. Further discussion would be required to set expectations on what your roof would look like if you go with the membrane. I would still say the same thing applies if you go with the sheet metal roof. Again, that oil canning effect. If you have uneven substrate and you're putting metal, thin sheet metal over it, it's going to look uneven. Even if you have a perfectly flat substrate and you just do a sheet metal roof over that without thinking about how thin that metal is and how warped it might be over time uh, or how warped it could look under under certain light. You know, these are all things that we would, uh, if we were designing a roof for a client, we would bring this up and talk about pros and cons. Yeah, you put stiffening ribs in your metal panels, it's going to cost more, but it's going to reduce the effects of that oil canning. It's going to look much nicer in the, in the long run. So again, I'm kind of black right here, but uh, hopefully it answers the question. Yeah. Of the alternatives, of the alternatives you mentioned, John, which of them are amenable to solar installation? So, solar panels. Uh, there are typically two ways of looking at how those go on. Either they're ballasted, where there's zero to very minimal number of fastener penetrations going through the actual roof covering. Uh, or there's, you know, fastened condition where you have a lot of holes going through your roof covering. I would say a uh, metal roof and a low slope membrane roof can accommodate um, PV panels on a steep slope roof, but it really depends on what system, what the PV panel manufacturer or the designer of those PV panels requires for, for securement that I would want to know if I was designing a low slope roof or a steep slope roof. Because I want to know how many holes we're putting this in the future. And, um, you know, ideally, PV panels are designed in conjunction with the roof. So these questions can be asked and there's a level of coordination. But even if that didn't happen, I would want some information from whomever might be doing the PV panel work down the road so I can incorporate those considerations in my design. Excuse me. I, yeah. Um, is there a reason that when you talk about metal roofs, you don't talk about a corrugated one? You just talk about the flat um, metal roof with the seams. Is that is that just an aesthetic question that was that been on the um, horizon in terms of this roof, or is it you can't do roofs this large with uh, corrugated, or what are the there, there are so many different types of, yeah. of metal panel roofs. Uh, you can do a corrugated, you can do a stainless seam, you can do a flat one, you can do copper, you can do stainless steel. Yeah, so it wasn't and just so, one no, that you yeah. you were talking about the flat one and, and right. um, yeah. I, I say flat right. because because the, the flatter the metal is, the more chance there is for uh, that oil canning Yeah, like that one, yeah. Natural yeah. corrugated, like right here, right? This this yeah. one here is going to be more susceptible to that oil can than right. this one, right. Right? right? And they also make shingle stop metal mm -hmm. to try to replicate that that shingle appearance. 
Yeah. Uh, Are any of them better for in terms of snow, especially since you have a low slope roof on this? Roof? I don't think. I don't think so. Uh, we would, you know, if, if, if considering different types of metal panels that exist. Um, we will look into that and potential for the slope to impact how we detail laps and the joints of all these materials. Um, but I don't think the, the slope and, and the roof of snow is, fully, uh, is necessarily directly impacted by the type of metal roof that you use. Mm -hmm. I will say a metal roof usually requires snow guards and ice guards. Yep, yeah. they do. Uh, these snow. device shooting off the yeah. roof, right? Yeah. So, uh, Whereas asphalt shingles has some granular texture to it. So yeah, you can still do snow guards and asphalt shingle roofs, but more often than not, depending on the severity and pitch of your roof, the asphalt shingle roofs provide sufficient texture to not require mm -hmm. snow guards. And just as another question, go back to the we and in, perhaps I miss this in the report, but you keep talking about you haven't been able to go in and really look at the um, status of what's underneath the shingles and um, is that was that I'm sorry was that a decision before the study was made and is that still a possibility to go look and see what's there or sure when we reached out to originally we were just I guess mm -hmm. asked to do just a visual only at this time that's what okay. our total of services included um, right we have you know, of course, we can go out there for additional services to do exploratory test cut observations. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't make the test cuts ourselves. We would either retain a roofing subcontractor to do them for us, or we would work with a roofing subcontractor that you retain in that case mm -hmm. um, to uh, make these observations where we would provide locations as to where what opening's done. Mm -hmm. make our observations, confirm the existing construction in those areas. And of course, we're talking usually about a small sample size, given the size of the group, but we try our best to make representative conditions uh, and place them in different areas to try to create some kind of repetition, right? Yes, it's constructed on, on this eave side one way, Oh, but wait, here's a very critical change that we've done this time for some reason. We try to capture that as best as possible through our exploratory communities. So it seems like, from what you're saying, no matter what we did, if we were to make a major change to revise the design of the roof, before we did that, we would have to do these kinds of destructive tests to make sure that the roof was fit for whatever the treatment was, that, that other remediation didn't need to take place because of damage that had taken place, or to, to even just discover the structure, the actual structure in place, no matter what the, the, the as built say, you would actually need to confirm that what you think is under there is actually there. So you would have to do this step no matter what. Is that, it, is that true? If we were being asked to design a roof replacement for this roof, a roof recovery, a roof recovery is when the, the, the building book allows you oftentimes up to one covering over an existing roof material. Mm -hmm. So there's the potential of leaving the asphalt shingles in place and doing a second system over top of it. That's, the, that's what the roof recovery term refers to. If we were asked to design either a roof recovering or roof replacement on this roof, we would absolutely want to do exploratory test cuts so that we know what we're designing to and designing you know, what we're working with for our design so that we can design the proper system, right? Um, we want to be able to see the condition of those materials below the asphalt shingle to understand their condition. Because we're not going to want to install anything over any deterioration. There may be localized deterioration due to moisture infiltration. There may be widespread deterioration. We don't know at this point. Um, one tool we often use on low slope roofs to assist with that, I don't know if anyone, anyone here has heard of the term infrared scanning or IR scanning. Basically, we use an infrared camera at certain times of the day um, to try to show temperature differences within our roof assembly uh, and, and, and try to locate anomalies where moisture may exist. So if you think about it, the IR camera, if, if it's a hot day, you would expect uh, that wet insulation would show as a cooler temperature 
then drying solution. And using the IR technology, we're able to do that oftentimes. It can be challenging with an asphalt shingle roof because the granule, granules can help, uh, can, can reflect the IR and kind of disturb that. But we did include some uh, limited IR in our carpet report. Uh, when we had the drone go up there, the drone had the IR camera on. So I'm just going to show you an example of what's about. You can see in this image here, this is, uh, this is the shot taken far back uh, above your roof. We're showing these dark anomalies of these dark patterns on this roof here. This could be really the one square. It could be not, I mean, it's not a perfect science. Again, you have the asphalt shingles that can impact you, but we are seeing a very unique anomaly in this particular photo that we would want maybe if we're doing exploratory test cuts to take a test cut here at the eave to see if the material's wet. Take a test cut here in the field to see if the material's wet. And it might help direct where we select our test cuts to see if there's any wet materials. Here's a perfect example of a very isolated condition where we have a dark color appearing on our camera. You can also see these lines here, hopefully, I don't know if you see it on the screen. Can you see these kind of vertical lines at the yeah. patterns? Yes. What that is, is that the actual speathing joints that make your asphalt shingles, that's captured by the IR camera. Why are you seeing those? The, the reason may have to do with the escape of, uh, is your building a, a Air condition? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I believe we did this evaluation in warm enough months. So that could uh, represent um, air escaping from the inside, effectively cooling the surfaces at these joints, which is why you're seeing it at I don't know. Um, <clears throat> So we can do a more depth IR scan to help us in the future try to identify areas concerned where the moisture may exist and we can use exploratory test cuts in hand with that technology to, to, uh, to try to determine the condition of the materials underneath the asphalt shingles. Okay. Yes, we would want to do that if we were asked to do a design of a roof replacement or roof recovery. Yes, we would want to do that if we were asked to opine uh, or to provide opinions on was the roof constructed in accordance with the contract documents? Uh, did the contractor install it as the design shows? Like if we're asked to do any level of opinion of that effect, we would have to absolutely do that as well. So John, it might make sense for us to look at ways of stretching parts of the roof just to get a little more life out of them. Um, or not. I'm just wondering if you have any opinions on that. If we're doing a roof replacement, would you suggest that we replace everything just in case um, it's decided to go that route? A, lo a lot of factors go with that as well. What, what, what is the, uh, you know, all the folks, what would you consider acceptable uh, aesthetic of the building? Now, with any roof remediation topic would be something I would want to know. If you're switching a portion of the roof over to a different roof material, where do you stop that that work and where do you leave the asphalt shingles, right? What's that gonna look like from the ground? What's it gonna look like from the you know aerial images? What's gonna be acceptable aesthetically to the uh, uh, I think we would want to know that from you guys first off. Uh, um, but going back to that, um, this this graphic here, is there is there a potential? You know, if we're, if we're trying to do this in phases, or if you're trying to do it just the worst areas first and see how the rest of it forms. I mean, yeah, there's a potential of doing that. You have this whole area here that has widespread deterioration. Um, you might focus on this area first, depending on the roof system that you do. Um, we would have to really think about how an untouched roof transitions with a new roof, depending on the system. So we would have to have unique details here, here, 
at the ridge, you know, wherever existing terrain needs new route, we have to think that through pretty hard and come up with the detail there, depending on what the route is. So I have a question. Um, well, I have a couple of questions actually. So you mentioned that towards the end of the report here that it might be, in, in the words of the report, it may be beneficial to have GAF re-inspect the roof as the initially observed issues at only the lower roofs. What would be the point of that since they've already voided the warranty based on the design of the roof and it, it not having ventilation? What could we benefit from by having them back? One thing for sure is what they reported before is not the case anymore. There's new information in that this defect, like, uh, let me just pull up their, their document here real quick. Uh, again, they, unless there's other documentation I'm not aware of from GAF, I have this four page document that you gave me, Patrick, yeah. which is the letter from GAF to the town of Hadley dated November 15, 2022. They gave you a very brief letter with very minimal backup observations on what they observed. What I take here is they are acknowledging that there is no ventilation on this roof, right? This image here says no soft vent, vent present at the eaves, no ridge vent, vent present at the ridge. So they're acknowledging the lack of ventilation. They're also uh, identifying some miscellaneous defects like exposed fasteners some physical damage, some chip shingles. Um, and they're also talking about this drip line here, resulting in isolated, but more regular current damage along that drip line. So in looking at the backup limited photos they provided, um, and this, this one here says, at your drip line, you have damage shingles present uh, at all the low roof areas at the drip line. Let me just see one last thing here. Uh, damage present, no damage present. When I when I go back to the letter, what does it say? It says, uh, appears to be damaged shingles beneath the E from the upper roof, so at that drip edge condition. That appears to be caused with blistering and thinning out of the corners of the shingles. They didn't observe any blistering or damaged shingles on the main upper roof. That statement right there is not true anymore. Because now we have this buckling condition. And I don't know if that buckling condition existed back in 2022 when they were out there when we first put the claim up to them. But there, it, it may not result in anything, but there's new information. It may be beneficial to have GAF come out and check the roof again and see what they say. Will they give you anything? Maybe not. Maybe they will. I, I don't know. Um, but there's new information that doesn't align with what they're saying here. Um, I'm interested in seeing what they would what they would say. Okay. Um, let me see what else it says. Let me skim this. The problem appears not to be due to a problem with your shingles, and any repairs are not covered under the limited warranty. So this letter is saying something to do about a limited warranty. Uh, I think from, from you, Patrick, you, you said that there was no warranty on this project, is that right? Uh, no, there was, I mean, do you mean on the shingles themselves or on the, yeah. the from the contractor? Well, on, on the manufacturer themselves for the shingle, I, I believe those close up mills had some language in there about a residential style of warranty from the manufacturer, is that right? Uh, the, that detail, the, I, I, that escapes me right now, but there, there was some okay. form of warranty from the manufacturer of the shingles. And that's what we were sort of appealing to when we got in touch with them and said, please come in and inspect this because something's wrong. Um, and if it, I assume if there had been no warranty, they would not have come out to look at it if, if there was nothing in place. My so this statement here, please be, please be assured your limited warranty remains in full force and effect according to the terms and conditions. Okay. Um, so we could call we the warranty again. still, and there's there's a new condition that's yeah. arising. Yeah. What are they going to say if they come out? I I could predict that maybe they're going to say, oh yeah, you have buckling shingles. Sorry, you 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 installed a non-vented uh, roof system. We don't warrant warrant non-vented roof system. 
Right. But that just still good information from the cop. Now, what does that tell you? Where was this information when we agreed to, from the designer to install this on our roof? Right. Yeah. So, so going back to this information. That practice. was that was my next question because we, you know, you sort of touched on this this afternoon, and, and I wonder if you could just talk about this, just sort of switching hats here from from um, being someone who's consulting on the potential remediation of the roof, also switching and, and talk a little bit about you know the, the potential role and the kinds of questions you might be asked if you were being asked to um, comment on that process and how it went. Because you mentioned something to the effect of like, the, you know, we know that roofer, I'm surprised that the roofer would have, you know, would have, would have gone along with that in a situation where they know that this is not in compliance with, you know, yep. the general use of this product. So can you just talk about, about a little bit about that and the things that stick out to you um, from what you know of this? Yeah, so every project has, well, I should say every project. Most projects have mountains and mountains of documentation and correspondence that occur during the, the length of the construction, from emails to field reports to whatever. We haven't seen any of the stuff today. So we can't say for a fact whether the contractor stomped his feet, raised his hand, and said, we don't want to install this roof. If we install it, we you know we can't comment on any of that right now because we don't have that documentation in front of us to be able to. Um, what I can say is this is not a typical way to install asphalt shingles in this plant, um, and I can I can you know, guess that GF is going to come if they come back out are going to comment about ventilation being a problem next. Yeah. But um, in terms of why the contractor installed it. I can't speak on behalf of the contractor. I would have to, you know, I would ask, maybe there's something in the, in the project literature if that still exists or the project documentation um, in correspondences where, where that's captured um, on, on why the contract installed a hot roof. I'm using quotes here, I don't like that term, but a hot roof and, and also why the designer decided to design a hot roof. Yeah. I would, I would be very interested in seeing if there's any project documentation that captures that question. So, um, so let me ask you about that. Think, let, yeah, me, yeah. let me just break in here real quick. Because you did mention um, that it is, is standard in Massachusetts for there to be a six year um, statute of limitations for taking action in this case. So when I went back to, um, to our OPM, I went to the OPM and asked for the documentation, essentially the paper chain that, we're, that you're talking about there, to be able to see the discussions that took place, the job reports, um, and the response that I got from uh, Mark Sullivan was that those documents and all the project files for this building have been archived. Is that, a, and, and that it would, it would be difficult for them to get them for us. Now I didn't insist on it, but is there is that something that we are they're obligated to provide? Generally speaking, if you ask for it, because you we're in that yeah. I mean we're out of warranty, but we're still within a kind of a, a timeline of legal protection where we can take action. Does that? Oh, so so I believe the statute of limitations for construction in Massachusetts we have six or seven years. Okay. Either way, it sounds like you're still within that. Yeah. I don't know offhand what the legislature requirements are for OPMs, designers, contractors, so on and so forth to retain project information before they delete it. I know on behalf of Yale, we, 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 we try to hold on to stuff as much as possible and now that life is more digitized than it was 10 years ago and beyond. Um, but we keep our files as long as possible. A lot of other architecture firms, design firms, keep it at least up till that statute of limitation ends. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a requirement of Massachusetts. I, I would I would suggest your top if you have, if the town has counsel, that'd be a good question for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I find it hard to believe that either the OPM, the designer, or the con the GC for this project doesn't have a good I'd be surprised if they don't have a good available project record for this job. You have COVID that you have to deal with during this job, it sounds like, which threw a whole wrench in the normal way of construction. 
So that's one potential impact on the documentation that would be available. But when we're talking about the length of a project from, uh, from the project substantial completion to now, you're within five years of something. I'd be surprised that that information is not sitting available somewhere. It's especially with digital. I mean, digital five years ago is pretty common practice, right? Yeah. Uh, paper, maybe, maybe paper gets thrown away much more easily on, on behalf of those folks. Um, but there should be a digital record of this project somewhere. I believe there is. It's just, it was more a matter of the inconvenience of, of accessing it and, and whether we wanted to push them at that point um, at a time when we're still sort of, you know, we are working cooperatively with them and, and the right. architect when, you know, as, as we need to. So we didn't really want to push the point um, too, too far, but, um, but that is where that information yeah. is that we would have to ask someone to, to you know, cough it up to really get into that. Now, I, I, do you know if archive was, oh, it's paper documentation, so it's archive it's it's a digital. bunch of file boxes? It's, no, it's, it's, it's all digital. It's digital. There were digital project reports that were, that were created, um, that were shared. But in order to yeah, get them, I mean, I mean, they would have, you, I don't have, what I'm not privy to are the, the, the meeting minutes, the conversations that would have taken place between the architect, the OPM, and the, and the contractor, for instance. Only what I was in a room for. I don't have the documents about, you know, the conversation that would have led to the re-engineering of the roof from a metal roof to a shingle roof. And, you know, at this point, maybe that ship has sailed, but it, I, I think the, that information is out there, but it's always been a mystery at what point that actual conversation took place and who said to who, yes, and this entails re-engineering. Are we going to do it? Are we not going to do it? That, that's the black box that we don't know what, you know, we don't know right. what happened there. Right. And uh, I know for us to unarchive documents is very easy. I can't speak on behalf of the OPM of on unarchiving digital documents. Yeah. But outside of the OPM, the designer is another avenue, the contractor is another avenue. I'm not suggesting we go to them now with that question. Um, the town of Hadley, do you know if they have anything in their records or do the, does the library have anything in their records? I don't know what role the library or the town have in this job. We have well, access to, to some of that, but not. To, again, we don't have we don't have the internal yeah. correspondence. That it really seems not like it's meeting minutes and, and emails that we don't have access to. So there's a potential the OPM yeah. really led the show for the town to have the potential, yes. or at least the library yes. uh, did have the things. Yeah. Um, now going back to the statute of limitations again, you're within that. If that's an avenue that you are considering, I would definitely cons uh, suggest reaching out to town council first, explain the situation to them, assuming that Hadley has their own in, in, you know, in-house in uh, council, um, and talk about what's happening here. Maybe those discussions have happened, maybe they haven't. If you're definitely well within, you know, well within that um, statute of limitations, and there's a, there is the potential of, of recouping some some costs and, and, and uh, for for rectifying this issue. I can't say what will happen or will not. I can't uh, say whether the the fees of an expert witness will be covered uh, for your counsel. But it's just um, there is that potential avenue, and having those conversations with the town council may be a, may be an option for you. Yeah. Well, what else? Uh, any I other think, questions? What, what is interesting, I will say, is the fact that the drawings do call for, I'm trying to remember, was it the base scope was to do metal panel and the, uh, the alternate scope was to do asphalt shingle? Do I have that correctly or is it swapped? It, it became swapped. It, because of the budget concerns, we, we went with, a, with the asphalt roof and the alternate was a metal roof, which we ultimately could not afford. Okay. So this as built drawing, I believe, has listed in the event that the alternate was to do a panel. Is that right? Yes, which we did not do. Yeah. What, what but it does that it does beg the question on metal panel versus asphalt designer. Did you consider ventilation uh, uh, the improved benefits of having ventilation? Did you have those discussions with the owner? Uh, as to the pros and cons, maybe that maybe that exists, maybe it doesn't. Like we can't we can't know that at this point in time. Is the lack of ventilation uh, 
Is that unusual in a project of this size, in this kind? It's unusual for any commercial building where you have asphalt shingles. Whether you have the insulation above your roof deck or whether you have it at the floor level of your attic. It's unusual because the commercial industry, the commercial construction has a lot more industry knowledge than the residential office, right? And the industry roofing practice in our region calls for ventilation of asphalt shingle roofs. So it is uncommon that they would install asphalt shingles over unvented space. Is it and possible? GAF, I believe, is the manufacturer of these shingles. Yeah. And if I was to open up the current day uh, product data for their shingles, they would talk about ventilation right up front and how important it is to have. And I'm sure five years ago, maybe there's a, a product data, the problem would be it, maybe there's a product data in the, uh, in the closeout documents we received that has the information right then. Why, what, what were those conversations uh, the, between the designer, the contractor, and the manufacturer are installing these shingles on an offensive group? I, 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 that that puzzled me, honestly. Again, is it a solve off to avoid buckle shingles? No. Our report talks about other potential contributing factors of, of why uh, asset shingles may buckle. But it's definitely a key point to how this roof was constructed and not providing ventilation. And it is a potential contributor to the bottling conditions you have. Yeah. Well, does anybody have anything else that they'd like to add? Oh, we don't want to keep you all night. And, uh, and we, we have, we have the, the, kid, the kids are sleeping at this okay. point. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to hang as long as you need. Uh, yeah. My wife is happy because they're sleeping. And uh, you know, so just let me know. Uh, yeah, I can stick around a little longer if needed. Yeah. It, it, one, it, is it standard for a roof of the, a project of this size to only be guaranteed for two or three years? From the contractor or from the manufacturer? Whoever contractor in this case. That was a two year. Well, yeah, it was a two year warranty from the contractor. Is that typical? Typically, the contractors will either provide a one year. Uh, workmanship guarantee or two-year workmanship guarantee. That's pretty common. That doesn't relieve them of having to come back and fix stuff beyond that point because of the statute of limitations, right? Uh, they may be held liable for issues observed beyond that two-year mark. But that becomes more of that to be able to have a bet. And either they play nice or they don't. Yep. Depends on the severity of the issue or the black bear, right? Um, but yeah, two-year uh, workmanship guarantee is pretty, pretty standard, pretty common. One other thing, do I understand that the lack of this ventilation is a major factor in the problems with this roof? Uh, I want to use the exact verbiage I have in my report, so I'm not correct in what I'm saying in the report. Uh, so I put a lot of thought into the words I use a lot. Bear with me while I flip the video for a second. <clears throat> if, you, uh, if, if you're able to see, um, I'm going to change the CL so it's easier for you to read. You just kind of read that statement there. I'll read it on that. Ventilation provisions are not present within the HPL uh, as a public collaboration system. As observed during the visual evaluation is as documented in the as built drawings. It is Yale's opinion that lack of ventilation contributes to the observed as function of Okay. Those are the, that, that's our opinion. Thank you. Uh, again, in this section, we talk about other factors that could be present that could also be contributed to asphalt sugar water. John, what page is that on? That statement? 15. 15. 15 top. Okay. Thank you. And I reference, I reference generally some, when I say industry standards, roofing industry standards, 
Uh, I talked about it here, the NRCA, the ARMA, which is the Asphalt Ruby Manufacturers Association, APA, which is the uh, Engineered Wood Association, the Poly ISO Cyan Urine Insulation Manufacturers Association. There's four industry standards right there that talk about the need for ventilation underneath asphalt shingles. It's a very known thing in this, in this in commercial area. It's also known in, in residential construction, which is why you have soft vents and ridge vents on your roof. Someone, somewhere, contractors, roofers know that the that ventilation is required on your house. Therefore, it's known it's usually needed in, in commercial buildings in the Northeast. It's, it's helpful that you that you cited those because it's also been a mystery where those best practices come from and how to you know how we would reference those other than just that we'd be hearing anecdotally that yeah you just don't do that so it's good to have those yeah and and you know if this was a more in-depth uh, report where we were asked to provide expert witness style opinions and services we, we would be quoting directly from these folks and putting those quotes in our report uh, it's just through that information that if you're curious about after the fact here on what you know where to access those feel free to reach out yeah um, i can get you the title and everything and that information's handy in those uh, we, we have all that in the library as well so very good so anything else that that uh you want to ask John before we let him go? No, I, John, I just want to thank you for the detail you had in this report. Yeah, absolutely, we're happy. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're grateful you guys reached out to us in the first place. We, we hope this ends up becoming helpful. We're, we're here with any other questions, obviously, tonight or, or down the road. Um, and uh, we hope you come to a resolution that works for yourselves and the town of Adelaide. And we're here to help as you. That's great. Thank yeah, you. and we'll we'll be in touch with uh, with additional questions. I'm sure as we um, as we digest this and um, this conversation spills over to the other folks that are not here, but are you know the other stakeholders that, that need to be a part of this. So I'm sure we'll be back in touch very soon. But thank you very much for your time yeah. tonight. Absolutely, and I'll say it again. If it happens, if the meeting happens after the fact, where they are available, and you would like me to speak on the happy meal, yeah. just let me know. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you With very much. much possible. Thank you. Right. Apologies yeah. to your wife. Yeah. No, she's good. She's the kids are asleep. She's happy. Well, yes, but you didn't do bad through story time, so thank you. My, 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 that's all right. Grand, Grand BK was here. There was corrupt stuff. <laughs> <laughs> thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you, Have a good night. Thank you all. Have a great one. Uh -oh. Do you need to plug in your, wait, are you not plugged in? Do you want me to plug your laptop in? Do you have a port? I didn't bring it because it was uh -oh. fully charged. I didn't think uh -oh. we were going to. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, how much battery? We better, we better move fast because you're about to. And oh, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> that wasn't much warning time. <laughs> Poor Julie. Usually there's more than that. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> Well, we are 90 minutes in. At least we, we yeah. I didn't even realize we were so close to the, uh, to the edge, but at least we did our thing with, uh, with John and got what we needed, so that was great. Um, that was very helpful. I think that was a really uh, helpful conversation. Yeah, I mean, my hot takeaway is that that roof is a mess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just a it's summation a of job. it. Boy, in yeah. a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. We got... <clears throat> We got shafted, as they say. <laughs> That's what it seems like. Well, there's there's a lot you know there's a lot to talk about, and I think there's a there is a, a, a good a good question for whether we should go back to town council and say you know we have this report, we know what you said before, but based on again my my takeaway is that as soon as they put. As soon as they made that determination to put that particular roof on, they void. They initially they just voided the warranty for the product for the shingles themselves. Just they want GAF. Well, I mean, meaning the warranty was voided by using them in the way that they were used. There was no warranty in effect because as soon as anything went wrong with it, they were just going to point to the design of the roof and say this wasn't supposed to go on that roof. 
there's you know we're not covering that. So that that's the problem um, in effect. But yeah, the, the the conversation is more about I mean you know again I don't want, I don't I think it's premature to point fingers, but I mean this was a design a design consideration um, that came out of needing to save money when cost estimates were coming in high. Well, I remember being there for that vote. Mm -hmm. um, and my father was a carpenter. Again, it's not genetic. I know that. But, you know, I've always been tuned into roofing and, and these different things, and it's just so important. And if there was any way to afford a metal roof, that was the way we needed to go. Yeah. But at the time, we also didn't have the money available. So it was a real dilemma on what to do. Yeah. I mean, we, we made that decision very reluctantly. We, we, we did, and, but it, that's not really the issue. The issue really again, right. comes back to whether or not the appropriate engineering was done to make that change. And, you know, we went through a process where many, many, many changes were made in the process and the design of the building. And, again, because we were paying architects and engineers, you assume that every change that was made, that that also entailed the appropriate engineering for the change and it, it's just it really is an open question of, of whether or not that that happened and that really seems like it's something that's going to if we're ever going to find that out it has to be through their own internal documents and communications about what was said and what was not said well based on what he said and i wasn't here when the design was done and all of those decisions were made based on what he said it's a matter of the roofer not doing the job they should have done well, he, he, they basically did something that they should have looked at. I mean, again, they didn't know, well, they did know there was no ventilation because they would have seen, they would have been aware of that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they, they, could they, could they, did they protest to, you know, say the OPM or to the architect, to the contractor himself? Again, what conversations happened at that level, I'm not, we're just not aware of. We don't know, you know, without looking at meeting minutes and you know, work reports. Well, and it was, you know, a, a real concern that we just didn't have the money to go with a metal roof. There wasn't the alternative, but you are right. You know, did they look at that? Did they redesign what was necessary? Well, oh. a roofer should know that it needs to be ventilated. The basic the thing that he described, so should the that architect. situation. Uh, a roofer well, needs to know that. But the architect was also, if they were driving this, I mean, right, and the roofer just works for the general contractor. The contractor says, that's the way they want it, you know. That's what they can afford. And for again, there's like a whole, yeah. and once you start, unfortunately, once you start peeling this back, there's so many fingers pointed in so many different directions about, um, you know, where where this went No response. Yeah. It's, it's a very Nobody's going to volunteer for the blame. No one is going to, so. <laughs> The only thing you can hope is that someone's going to throw somebody else under the bus and say it was... Yeah, really rat somebody out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have the smoking gun right here. But, yeah, that is the uh, So now it turns into what are the next best, best steps, and I know that won't be decided tonight, but I know that that's going to be an ongoing issue. So then my takeaway is that the roof was initially designed to hold a metal roof. Yes. And then when it became apparent that that metal roof was going to be very expensive, the shingles were slapped on yes. without a redesign to take into seemingly, account. Seemingly without a redesign. Mm -hmm. and again, we don't know that for sure, but that seems to be, seems to be what we're relevant. assuming, that, that it was not appropriately redesigned. Okay. So what is the next steps for the board to do regarding this? It seems to me that it would be a really good idea for at least Tommy and Gary to watch this and they can describe to Carolyn what their takeaways are. Can you tell me who Tommy and Gary are? Um, town building manager and the building inspector. Okay. So Tom Quinlan, Gary Berg, yeah. long time employees, yeah. yeah. Gary Berg is technically, he's, I mean, actually I don't know his time, but he does building maintenance. That's what we, what, I, I think it's even sort of a sub-department of DPW that there's a, a maintenance department. Okay. I think they need 
to see this. Mm -hmm. And then I think we ask the town administrator to at least share either all of it or the end of it with town council I think, the whole thing would be I think the whole thing would be instructive for town council to watch the whole thing, the whole discussion of what's wrong with it and then why. May I ask, uh, if nothing is done, is the library in danger of, of serious leaks that could damage the collection and the building? It sounds to me like it's a sloppy job and that's imminent, that it's it, coming apart. I'm not going to comment on that because I don't. I, I, we're not. None of us are mind readers, and we don't want to get. You know. Well, you said it was not. I mean, who, what do we know? But all we can all we can really say is that so far we've had some actual leaks and some water staining. I mean, as minor as it's been, it has happened, and it was surprising. And and obviously, John and Gail Gail is surprised to have seen it this quickly. You know, we have some staining in, in the local My history. My question comes out of his yeah. comments yeah. and their observations. And if those observations are there now, it's clearly a risk. It only yeah. means that it's going to get worse. And impacting the insulation that's below. It was really telling with that picture he had yeah, of right. the roof showing the staining underneath. Mm -hmm. I think the this, is, this yeah. is not something that's going to stay as it is. That's my take from all of this. No. Well, the question is how quickly right. does it change right. and what do we change it to? No matter what you do, you're talking about a year or two just of going through the whole, going through the motions of having, oh, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, the, the bidding, you know, the, the, the procurement, the actual redesign, as you're saying, like having to do all the testing just to uh, assess the current state of the building. Not to mention getting somebody to work. agree to have it looked at and to make the decision to have it done. Sure. Yeah. So we're and, talking and about funding, yeah, there's, there's, it, it'll take a while before anything happens. I don't think, I don't think we need to be in, in a panic about it, but obviously it's something that's, it's an act. We need to move it along. Well, yeah. yeah. Given the fact that anything that's done is going to take two or three years, I think panic now is not an inappropriate. Uh, I don't I panic. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't. I think that we're. I think that we've got it in hand. We've been we've been wrestling with this from day one. So this is not something that we're being. I mean, this is kind of like coming to, at you. There's a lot of information coming at you very quickly. But we're. I think the the rest of us who've been with the project are not necessarily blindsided by any of this because we've been kind of wrestling with it for about four years now yeah. so it's really a matter of my point is that yeah. because it's been incremental yeah. we think well this will this is incremental it's going on but i see a panic I, not a panic but i see it an there's a definite there's sense of urgency yes. yeah. yes. because, yeah. because doing anything about it is going to take two years at the minimum of course that's not going to improve in two years. No. It's only going to get worse. And at this rate, if it's done this in two years and they, and they built it wrong, it's not going to get better. Right. Well, they didn't build it wrong. They built it to the no, specs. They didn't, put a vent. they didn't put a vent there. That's well, a major they designed it wrong. They designed it wrong, but they did not have a ridge vent. They never called for a ridge vent. Right. They didn't redesign it right. That's yeah. a major factor. Yeah. That's a mistake and a major factor in the deterioration of the roof. So I'm saying, yeah, it's going to take two years to get somebody to do something about it. Look what's happened in the last two years. And that's only the beginning. Sure. It's not going to go away. No, yeah, it's, not, yeah, it's yeah. just going to get worse. That's what well, I'm saying. Unfortunately, not much has happened in the last couple of years. It's, the sky is not necessarily falling. <laughs> we need to act the on The roof this. is. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think we're not, I don't think anyone is putting their head in the sand. I think that's why we just spent, uh, you know, an hour and a half with, with John yeah. and Gail. But, um, but yeah, I think we just need to move with deliberation. And again, we need to be good stewards, not only of the building, but also of, you know, the, the investment that the town made in the building. To Absolutely. make sure that we're we're doing the right thing to protect that investment and, and protect the asset for the town. So that's I think why we need to do this deliberately and not do anything in a pan panic, not act prematurely, consult as many people as we can 
to get as much information as we can before we then make a very informed decision that, that may that, that may be costly. Uh, I must have yeah. I must have given you the impression that I'm panicked. Definitely. I'm panicked. I'm worried. Yes. I'm okay. Panicked. I think we're 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 all in that boat. Yeah. We're all worried for sure. Okay. Yep. Director's report. Oh wow. <laughs> it feels like we're just we're just getting started now. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll keep this really short. Um, we have started the long-range planning for or the, the, the survey process, uh, just as an update for about the long-range plan. What Joanne and I determined to do, because we're working on, we're working on the, um, the data collection to inform the, long, the writing of the long-range plan. And so what we decided to do as a next step, and I, I think we talked about it at the last meeting, but we determined that we were going to run three weekly surveys in the month of August, like three weeks in a row, we were going to run a, you know, a fairly short survey on one subject, you know, thematic, thematic surveys three weeks in a row. We started the first one, they take about five minutes, no more than 10 minutes, if, if you know, it's a really short survey where we, made it public on Friday afternoon. We're up to 120 as of the beginning of this meeting. We had 120 responses. Um, an email blast went out to all town residents letting them know that, that we're collecting this information. We're getting a good response. I'm hoping that we will have at least 200, if not 300 responses when this closes at the end of the week. And then we move on to the next survey on the next topic. Um, and once we have that in hand, we'll examine the results of that and then we'll determine next steps, which will probably be another face-to-face co -face conversation with a selection of library patrons and stakeholders to talk about that data, talk, talk about what sticks out um, and get more commentary from people than the surveys allow. And then from that, we will start writing the long-range plan itself, a draft of it um, to go over as a group and hopefully finalized by fall, sometime this fall. Um, I submitted the updated capital plan to uh, to Carolyn, um, town administrator, and Linda Sanderson, town treasurer. Uh, in the current year, that's a ten year. It's a ten year plan. Um, in the current year, I've indicated that we're going to request $10,000 as a capital procurement in order to pay for additional computers. We're not replacing computers. What we're doing is we're doubling the number of available computers for the public because we're finding that more and more, now that we've been open for a couple of years, now that we're out of COVID and we're seeing the numbers continue to grow, that we're having more and more instances where all of the computers in the adult section are full. All of the computers, you know, there are six in the adult section. There are two in YA. Oftentimes after school, the two computers are both in use. There are two in children's. Oftentimes those are both in use after school. So we want to, and we have the available space for twice as many computers. So we're going to be basically filling all of those slots, the available slots with computers for the public. We're good with staff computers. Everything on that end is fine. And then going forward, probably every five to six years, we'll be going back to the town to then start replacing them because that first generation of computers that we bought when we first moved into the building will be reaching the end of their life. So this will just be a sort of a rolling replacement where we replace half of the computers at a time. Uh, How do you get your recommendations? How do you know what to buy? Um, the town generally buys Dell computers. We've been buying Dell computers um, as long as I've been here and buying computers. And I, I believe they may also, don't quote me on this, but they may also have um, the state contract for for public projects. Um, yeah. So they, they, they're just kind of the go-to. They've been very reliable. They've been fine um, so far. Uh, web update that's ongoing. We did make the determination and signed a signed a contract with um, library library market 
library marketplace. I can't remember the name of the company, but they provide that the product library calendar, which will be deploying at the same time as a redesigned uh, website. So we're hoping to have that. Uh, my 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 target date for that is November first to have both the calendar and the website up and running. Uh, what was the name on that group? Did you say? It's, I believe it's called Library Marketplace. Is the company? Okay, that, that's they're the vendor. And the product is Library Calendar. Okay. Because we talked about this in our last meeting. Uh, we yes. did. We did. We just, I'm just trying to update. Yeah, yeah. Like month by month, numbers. like where the progress yeah. on the website is. That's fine. I'm, I'm um, close. Wow. I'm already on page five of <laughs> minute notes. <laughs> And that's pretty much. I don't have any. I don't have any updates on um, on the wall repair. Um, I'm hoping that we have something soon on that. And I have no update on access hardware um, since the last meeting. Since the things that I heard. In the, oh, Duke, was it? Is there anything you wanted to say about the meeting that you attended for well, the? Jack and I. Oh, I was there virtually. There. And for, Jack was there in person. Right. Well, Mike's being able when he talked about the project because I was not there for that. But right. Is there anything worth mentioning to the group? Mostly he described all of the <coughs> obstacles that slowed it down. Yeah. And it appears that there are not obstacles now other than, I recall a capital request for some of the equipment to install in mm. the safety complex, or, or North Hadley, or the North It's Fire complicated, Station. and it sounds like the process is just in the middle at best. Um, oh, he middle. didn't lay out a strict timeline, I know. Um, but the senior center and the library were not at the top of the list. Everything else was. In, okay. Well, the neighbor who had been talking to me about this may come for public comment next month. So I just want to let you know. Okay. Just yeah. a heads up. Yeah, the middle though. You caught my attention with the middle. I, there was no sense of timeline, or I didn't get a sense of timeline? No. Okay. Okay. It is what it is. It has a big middle. Big middle. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest yeah. middle ever. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's pretty much all, all I've got. Any, anybody have any questions about anything? Thanks for sending out your goals. Oh sure. Yeah. Is that a? I don't have the agenda in front of me. Is that a specific item? Uh, there was something about yes. director's goals, okay. but um, it's this is quite a list. Do we want to postpone That's the goal discussion? We're to missing two people. So I mentioned this in the email. What I, what I would say is, um, what I would propose is that that everyone take a look at what's written here, make comments on this. What I will do between now and the next meeting is, if it's agreeable to do it this way, will be to write, and, and or maybe someone else wants to write it, but I'm happy to do it in a way that I think makes sense, and then you folks can comment on that. I, I gave an example of that in the email, and I don't have it in yes. front of me, but yeah. to take something like communication and basically make a, 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 a goal-like statement about that, so that all of the things that are under there, if you have to ask the question, well, why are you doing that? You know, why are you doing that? You'll be able to say, because it, it furthers the goal, okay. the larger goal. And so why. Communication, improving communication, outreach and communication, website and calendar to have that um, in place by November 1st or something like that. What kind of, how would you like us to f um, phrase these goals? I, I think, I, I mean, again, if you don't have any objection to my doing it, I think I, I would like to take a crack at putting something together that I think makes sense and then you tell me if you agree with it. You can also send things to me and say, I, this, we feel strongly about this, you know, I think this is something that we should synthesize, synthesize together, um, if at all possible, um, and then, and then go from there. But again, this is my, this is my opinion on how I think this could work in a streamlined fashion. And again, I'm, I'm well, I'm very welcoming of any input that you have. 
anything that you think is missing from here or anything that you think is off, we kind of like put it together and then, you know, we look at it at the next meeting and, and hopefully sign off on it. One thing, okay, two comments. Last year we did sort of characterize them in terms of the overarching subject headings that make up the evaluation that are taken from yep. the job description. So I don't think this is necessarily a big leap. It wasn't quite so broad. It were specific goals within those subject headings. Yep. And I don't know, maybe I'm looking for an outline that has access to library services and then some other broader goal and then a, th a third more specific item that falls under that Do you, is an outline form. Are you saying that you want it to line up more directly to what's in the evaluation, the evaluation categories or or not? Well given that when we do a review, it's doing so in the context of what goals were set, you know, what responsibilities exist, and within those responsibilities, what goals, specific goals were set. And I mean, I understand your point of view that having sort of broader overarching goals for the library But, I mean, even if we took half of what was on this page, that would be a lot. And I in guess order to, yeah. if you, I think there, okay, there are two ways. If you look at this goals relative to the strategic plan mm -hmm. that is going to be developed, that is going to be broader and more, more overarching. But if we look at it in terms of the director's annual review, that's more granular. Which is based on the job description. Right. Right. But the goals in a lot of ways, I mean, obviously these things are going to line up. These also could be slotted in. You could also take all of these things and plug. There's nothing here that doesn't exist somewhere in the job description. They all fall within right. that rubric as well. But when you're talking about goals, you're, you're, I, I think you're essentially talking about directions that should be emphasized. You're talking about something that you haven't necessarily yes. been doing in previous years, but that are relevant and important. Or something to, that has bubbled to, to the top. Right, that, because they're, they're timely right. now. Yes. Um, things that weren't, that are that have just gone by the wayside because well, we're, done, we're done with that. Um, but I had, a, I had a little bit of a problem last year, and, and you know, Susan, something that you said, Susan, at the last meeting, I think it was. You know, you made the point, and, and again, I've always been sort of philosophical about it, um, that again, we're always, we're all working within, we're all working from a place of good faith um, and that this isn't some kind of game playing that we're, we're doing here. But you made a very good point about, you know, the very specific nature of some of the way the goals were presented the last time and, and the fact that some of those things are, they're just, quite frankly, out of my control. Mm -hmm. So something like the access, so putting, you know, do, do access project. Well, yeah. You know, so does that does that make 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 it that I'm you know failing in what I'm doing? So that's why I felt like having these broader categories where you're, you're saying, well, why are we doing that? We're doing that because it's important to, you know, in, increase and improve the access to library services for all people, and that doesn't just entail that; it entails a whole number of things that move an important you know goal forward. Right. And that's that's other things. That's scheduling. That's how we schedule staff. That's how we, you know, look at the hours. Do we change the hours? We're going to get a lot of, I think, really interesting feedback from the survey that we're doing right now about hours. I and so I think too. it's going to be on the table that we're going to be looking at making changes. But unfortunately, it's not really a, a to me yet a slam dunk that it's just take the hours from here and move them over to here because mm. there's a I think there's an appetite for hours all over the place, including days that were not even open, i.e. Sunday. 
So, you know, all of this is going to be a big thing, but it's it, it's all part of the part of the part of the pie, yes. you know. And so that's why I'm trying to. I mean, I know it looks like a, a lot, and I can't. Again, I can't necessarily guarantee that all of this gets done, but they're all things that are sort of somewhere in the back of my mind from day to day. We've got to work on this. We've got to work on that. That. Uh, and. But I think you can it's set priorities right. among those. Absolutely. And some things won't get done. Some of the things, specific things won't get done for various reasons. Logistical, you know, just circumstantial. But, but these are the things that I'm thinking about. In, even if there are two categories, these are things we would like to see done. We want to see done. And then there's the next level. If you have time, these are other things. Certainly, prioritize them. Right. Yes. yes. Please do. You want yes. priority listing. Yes. Right. High priority, I mean, medium priority. However, we want to do that. But again, I think I think again having them under something that that identifies the reason that you're doing the thing, to me somehow well, seems very that's essential. Fine. Yeah. That's um, And then how how we, because again, I feel like that's what we're doing, months a month anyway. That's why I come to the meetings so that you know. The will of the board can be clear to me, and then I know what to do when I go to work the next day, because that's the priority, not something that I said. Well, I think I'm going to work on local history. The card catalog. The card catalog. <laughs> yeah. So there's always changing of emphasis and changing of priorities. And I think that's fine too, because I mean I view these goals as as annual. So what you start working on this year may get resolved in next year it's something else you know like you said something else bubbles up to right. the surface so it and they're not goals are not necessarily uh, well i don't think i don't think that they're necessarily a checklist they're not a to-do to list they're a, they're about progress did you mm -hmm. are you working toward a goal right. are you making a positive positive progression or negative progression are you moving closer are you moving further away um and and it's checking off the individual items below there that shows you that that progress was made. Yeah, we did this. That was there was a setback on that. We did that, mm -hmm. and you know, we're going places. You know, maybe the thing about the access, the after hours access, shouldn't have been characterized as you doing something, but you keeping on top. And checking in regularly. Absolutely, but I think the, right. I mean, I maybe think, maybe that was the that's how it should have been phrased last year. Absolutely, but, but there, I think there are five for for every one of those things like access or the roof. I think there are five other things that weren't mentioned that could again fall into that category that aren't being mentioned. You know what I mean? And so just worrying about the roof as though the roof was the only right. you know, physical plant consideration right. that we have to to deal with would be. Um, I mean, I think personally, I think it would be doing myself a disservice. I would be getting, giving myself short shrift for all the other things that we have to tackle. It's not just about like we'll keep on top of the roof, you know, yeah, yeah, somebody yeah. wants to do something. It's about making sure that the walls are painted, that the carpet isn't coming up, that the mm -hmm. you know that the lights are working, that the switches work. I mean, it's 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 a, a million things. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, those are the ones that are the most important. But any one of these can suddenly rise to. The, of course. To uh, yeah, there could be a flood crisis. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and I've said this to you. The wall. I said this to you before. You know, I see it through a teacher's lens, where every year we have a state listing of different goals, and the principals will pick a few of those for us to really concentrate on. It's just yep. rather than the whole list. Right. So. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty daunting list, and you have all sorts of other things that come up and things to work on. The roof is a perfect example. Yep. But to me, they're, ju they're just directions. You yeah. know, the directions to move in, even yeah. if they don't all get done. Yeah. You know? yeah it's measuring progress. Yeah. I am going to, since we've already talked about strategic planning and the steps that have been taken, and because we are missing two people, I am going to propose that we also postpone having a discussion about um, seeing if we have a volunteer to be a liaison to the friends from the trustees. And so the board subcommittee and the strategic planning that was 
roughly talked about, but would we move that to next month as well? Well, Patrick spoke about it. Okay. All right. About what's happening in next month. Okay. I mean, this month it's still the data gathering. Gotcha. And next month there might be something. Yeah. Out of that, those exercises. Yes. All right. So this is the strategic planning. Um, I will mention one other thing I am working on in advance of entertaining a motion to <coughs> adjourn. I went and I actually read the bylaws, and I think I was prompted to do so because I just rewrote the library, rewrote bylaws for another organization of which I am co president. And I open them up and the first thing it says is Goodwin Memorial Library. And I'm like, mm, no, that needs to change. And there are things in there such as it declares that we will meet on the second Tuesday at a specific time. And you don't put that in bylaws because it can change. Um, if there is anyone who is interested in playing with me on this, or I'll just go through it a couple more times and then share a draft, and we can have a conversation. In. Is that something that would get submitted to the town? Are they looking for the different boards to update their bylaws? No, this I just okay. I just happened to look at them because I was thinking about bylaws and realized that there's room for improvement. Yeah. And I don't know that the town I don't know, I'm not sure we can give them to someone in town hall, but it's mostly for our own Guidance. If I had more experience on the committee, I would volunteer, but I think I need, I need time to learn the committee and what it's yeah. doing, but I appreciate what you're doing. I think, I think talking to, to Joanne, you know, once you've kind of put some thoughts in order, I think, you know, just based on her duration yeah, on the board, she'll have a lot of, you know, thoughts on, on specifics. Yeah, I did send you the draft. You've been busy. I have. No, no, I know. I have looked at it. Sorry. I, no. <laughs> No, yeah. but I told you I was yes, doing this, I did, I did and I did it. send it to you. Yes. But it's just a very, it's the first rough card. Uh, anything ready for time? Prime time. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion to Second. adjourn at 9.03. Seconded. All in favor? Yes. Um, 